Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night wherever you are around the world. Welcome to our live coverage from Richmond, Virginia of the top eight of Pro Tour Dominaria. Rich Hagen alongside Pro Tour champions Simon Gertson and Louis Scott Vargas and of course Maria Barfoldi here at the desk. We're going to bring you all the action. Two quarterfinals coming right up. We're only a minutes away from the start of our live action. It's going to be a great day, Maria. What would you like to see here on the final day of Pro Tour Dominaria? Well, we uh, obviously some have some history in the making here, Rich, but we could see something really cool happen, and that is Kazuyuki Takimura could be person number nine in the history of Magic to win two Pro Tours. Right, and that's individually, because obviously we've got Marco yes. Bloom, Dirk Bavarovsky with multiple team wins alongside Kai. But Luis, what about you? What would you like to see? I would also like to see someone win a Pro Tour, but that would be Owen Turtenwald, <laughs> uh, you know, the two-time player of the year, former teammate, uh, one of my close friends. I, I would just like to see him hit that. Right, absolutely. Simon, for you? I would also like to see somebody win the Pro Tour. That's going to happen. Teferi, hero uh, of Dominaria. <laughs> okay. I saw it in Birmingham. Teferi almost got there in the hands of Leo Lehonen, and I think this uh, blue-white, this Esper deck, has what it takes to take it down. Well, there's only one of them left in a sea of red. Let's take our first look at the bracket here at Proto Dominaria. We are going to work from our top down. So our first two quarterfinals, we'll see Kazuyuki Takemura in pursuit of that second individual title up against Marcio Carvalho of Portugal. So that's red, black, mid range against red, black, aggro. And then Simon's Teferi hero of Dominaria list in the hands of Ernest Lim of Singapore against Gonzalo Pinto of Portugal, the second Portuguese player in the top eight. That's a phenomenal result for Portugal with red, black, aggro. So let's get into it. Maria, Luis, why don't you walk us through what's going on in that top part of the bracket, Kazuaki Takemura. All right, so Kazuaki Takemura, he's a game designer from Japan. This is his second Pro Tour Top 8. He won the other one. It was Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar in 2015. He's playing Abzan. He has five Grand Prix Top 8s and a win in Kyoto in 2016. Gold Pro, $85,000 in lifetime winnings. Personal hero, by the way, Siege Rhino. Hmm. Makes sense. Let's take a look at the deck he's bringing today. Red, black, mid-range. Luis, what do you think of this deck? So this is actually one of the more unique uh, red black decks in the top eight. He's got a couple copies of Karn, Sign of Urza, so he's he's going kind of big on Planeswalkers with five total. Uh, he also has Heart of Kiron, which combines very nicely with those Planeswalkers. And one of the, the funniest parts I think about the list is he's just running the Braska's Contempt, the double black spell, alongside his Goblin Chain Whirlers, having to run multiple swamps and Cinder Barons in order to accommodate that. So. Kazuki went with a much more powerful deck than the rest of these decks. He's paying some costs, though. Swamp does not cast Chain Roller very well, and, you know, we'll see if that ends up mattering. Do you think his power is enough to overcome the more aggressive strategy of Carvalho? Uh, if Kazimura does a good job uh, drawing magma sprays, then I think that'll help a lot. All right, let's take a look at Marcio Carvalho here, Team Hararuya Latin, a former draft master. This is his fourth Pro Tour Top 8, got second at World Champions, championships back in 2016 15 grand prix top eights and three wins his favorite magic memory is the first time he qualified for nationals and he is bringing red black aggro to the table all right luis what do you make of this again this is this is a more aggressive version as you said uh you know headlined by like four copies of rekindling phoenix uh, beaumont courier is one of the really big benchmarks in terms of what the deck's strategies are and marcio is looking to be the aggressor in this matchup uh he's also got a nice mix of cards he's got you know one glory bringer one shock one cut to ribbons so in a deck that actually sees a pretty good amount of cards for red black deck thanks to like beaumont courier chandra flipping your top card that sort of thing it, it is interesting running a couple different you know good one ofs what do you think of beaumont courier versus Goblin Chain Roller, so he's the one with the Couriers. Uh, well, Goblin Chain Roller is good against Beaumont Courier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that the decks that are running Beaumont Courier are well aware of the weakness against Chain Roller, sure. and they're paying that cost because of how good it is against Control. That said, in this top eight, there's only one Control deck. I'd much rather be on the side of no Beaumont Couriers. So in terms of when we watch this match in action, is there a turning point in the sort of traditional sense of Marcio's the aggressor, and there is a point where we can go, ah, that is the turn, that has now happened, now the matchup is favoring Takamura. What, what sort of things should we be watching for? So, you can, there will be games like that, but for the most part, I don't think we're going to see such a cut and dried thing because both decks are still playing good high end. This isn't, you know, the mono red aggro decks that we've used to see where 
you know, 24 one drops and 12 burn spells. You, Marcio still has Glorybringer and Shanja and Rekindling Phoenix. It, it's very likely that Takimura could stabilize and then Marcio just goes Glorybringer attack, you know, kill your planeswalker, kill your creature. Okay, well, that's on one side of the quarterfinals, but at the same time, we're going to be watching uh, the second quarterfinal, and this features Ernest Lim of Singapore. Um, he is 33 years old. This is his first. Pro Tour top eight, great job by him. Uh, had six previous Pro Tour starts, but not a winning record across that time. So this by far his best Pro Tour experience from Grey Ogre Games. He is running the one truly very different list in the top eight. There you see it, the island fans rejoice. This is the deck for you. You are all in on Ernest Lim. Simon, walk us through this Esper Control deck. Yeah, this is a, a control deck that has more win conditions than the blue-white list. So uh, next to here, uh, next to Teferi, you can see the Scarab God and a few Torrential Gearhulks, which allows Esper to really take over the game uh, much quicker than the blue-white decks. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going to see those sort of endless Tef Teferi looping itself uh, kind of thing out of Ernest Lim. On the other side of the table, we have from Portugal, Gonzalo Pinto. Let's take a look at him, 32 years old. I say, the second Portuguese player in the top eight. Phenomenal performance by them. First Pro Tour top eight. He has a Grand Prix top eight as well. 8-1, and then that intentional draw in constructed to make it in. Let's take a look at his red, black, aggro list. So uh, this is not the first time we're going to see decks like this. It is not the last time we're going to see decks like this. But walk us through it, Simon. Yeah, uh, this might look uh, very familiar to uh, what Carvalho is bringing to the top eight, of course. And you see exactly uh, what Luis just described. I think in particular the four Rekindling Phoenix, that gives this deck, even though it has one drops, a lot of staying power. You can even play a defensive game because the Phoenix dying, then coming back with haste, is really scary for your opponent. Okay, so in this matchup, it is clear that Ernest Lim has a bunch of counter magic and he has a bunch of removal. It is readily apparent that the removal is going to have targets. It is less clear that the counter magic is going to have the time to actually occur before those targets become targets. What's your sense of where the traditional blue role of countering things before they turn up is going to play out? Are we going to see those go away after sideboarding, those syncopates and those sensors, for example? No, you, you can't uh, just take them out. It also depends who's on the play. I think syncopate on the play is a lot stronger than on the draw, for example. Uh, same, same with sensor. Now, the most important difference, I think, is that we are not going to see this settle the wreckage dance, but instead it's just going to be Vraska's Contempt. So with four Fatal Push and four Vraska's Contempt, it's actually possible to deal with all those Heart of Kirins and all those Planeswalkers, something that can be more difficult if you just have uh, blue-white removal available. Okay, Simon, time to put it all on the line. Ernest Lim or Gonzalo Pinta coming out of this quarterfinal? They're both not the most experienced players. I have my eyes on Esper Control for that one. Luis, in your quarterfinal, Kazuyuki Takamura or Marcio Carvalho? Who do you uh, see coming out? I see Kazuyuki Takamura coming uh, out ahead. And at that point, Marie, he'd be one step closer to that second individual pro to win. But let's see how the cards fall. It is time for our first pair of quarterfinals here from Pro Tour Dominaria. Hello, good morning, and welcome to this, the very first set of quarterfinals here at Pro Tour Dominaria in Richmond, Virginia. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Paul Chion, and we are very excited to see exactly how these games go. I'm sure these players have been having, uh, well, hopefully not two sleepless nights as they prepare for these uh, final elimination stages, but we have heard they are ready in the feature match area. Let's head down there as we get to see our first set of quarterfinals. Hello, good morning, and welcome to this, the first set of quarterfinals here at Pro Tour Dominaria, Richmond, Virginia. I'm Tim Willoughby. Calling the game with me is Paul Chion, and we're going to get a chance to see two masters of the game, each with their own builds of red-black in our first matchup here. First up, we have Kazuyuki Takamura of Japan. He's already won a Pro Tour. He knows how good it feels. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side of things, Marcio Carvalho, he has come perilously close <laughs> on a number of occasions to hoisting that trophy, and 
he was desperately hoping to be able to convert this time. Uh, now, as things stand, Takimura, he was the guy that finished top of the Swiss, so on the play for the entirety of this series. And looking at his hand, plenty of reactive cards. And that kind of, I guess, what we would expect from his, what we've labeled the mid-range version of red-black. Um, it is uh, Marcio Carvalho that has the best shot at playing creatures early on, and we see that first creature in Scrap Heap Scrounger. Yeah, Kazuyuki had to make uh, the top eight the hard way here as he was sitting on a 12-3 and record but got paired down against Kevin Jones and had to actually play it out uh, as opposed to drawing in. Now, Pianola coming down, that giving a little bit of width to Takimura's board and also making sure that he does have an artifact. So unlicensed disintegration, fully powered up. Though I guess that Scrap Heat Scrounger, not the most exciting of targets for removal given that there's the potential for it to come back. And this is a really interesting matchup. Marcio, of course, is much more aggressively slanted. He's got the Bowman Couriers in the main, which is a card that I imagine gets boarded out in this matchup. Anything with one toughness is something you want to take out in the Chain Whirler Mirror. But it's something that I'm sure Marcio used to great success against the various control decks in the field. So a few options available for Marcio as to what to play next. I think he did have another copy of uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger in hand. In instead elected to go with Kari Zev. Now that does mean that Takimura has a straightforward creature to remove, but there's already that Scrap Heap Scrounger in the graveyard, so he may be a little bit uh, wary of doing that too soon as Ether Hub comes down for Takimura, hitting his mana early on, and that will be important for the Japanese player whose curve is a little bit higher. Uh, gets to cast Rekindling Phoenix on four. A big threat in the air that is maybe a little bit more fiddly to deal with. Yeah. Kazuyuki only on two copies of the Phoenix, but he does have a lot of expensive cards in his deck. He actually has four more cards that cost four more mana in his deck compared to Marcio. And I think traditionally when you have these, you know, kind of aggressive matchups, um, the deck that kind of slows down a little bit and goes over the top is the one that generally tends to have the, the, the edge going in. And of course, that Rekindling Felix literally going over the top uh, alongside a Thopter token, Takimura attacking in the air, Marcio Carvalho all about the ground attacks. And I guess it's going to come down to who's able to successfully deal with the opposing threats. Now, Takimura can block. Uh, Marcio, he's going to have to find some actual factual removal spells. Right. And again, oftentimes, you know, in, in matchups like this, you, know, you have access to four copies of a braid. You have a bunch of cheap removal. So most of the cheap creatures end up just kind of dying to all the removal. So it's kind of like last threat standing. And Rekindling Phoenix is just one of those best threats because it's so resilient to removal. Takamura, at least for now, content to carry on attacking, does see an abrade from the other side of the table. So at least for now, that uh, Phoenix relegated to being an egg. We'll see whether or not there's... Uh, any follow-up that's going to be able to deal with that egg this time around. Yeah, Marcio really wants to find a Goblin Chain Whirler here. Let's take a look at his hand, because if he does, he will be able to get rid of that egg uh, without actually expending a resource to do so. Uh, it looks like he's got an unlicensed disintegration, and he might actually look to use it right now, because otherwise he would just won't be able to deal with that Phoenix. Yeah, and while it is kind of a two-for-one, that three point of damage to the head means that it doesn't hurt quite so much. Looks like Marcio passing things back, and we see unlicensed disintegration coming from Takimura here. Killing off Karizev. And there we see... Oh, that feels so bad. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, but it just feels so bad using two of your removal spells on just one creature. And, you know, Marcio realizes how important that Rekindling Phoenix is. He's playing the full four copies of it in his deck, so... Yeah, at least in the main deck, just... Uh, a few copies of Rekindling Felix available to Takimura. One more left in his list that he could potentially draw into. And it is one of the bigger cards in the matchup. This is an interesting card for the matchup. Each player has one of them cut to ribbons. On the front side of it, it's a straightforward removal spell. On the back side, though, uh, making an opponent lose X life uh, on the aftermath could be relevant if this game goes long. Yeah, yeah. Cut to ribbons is... I mean, it just functions as an additional removal spell. This type of deck, because it has just so many big resilient threats, it's not really actually interested in burn spells like Lightning Strike, for example. It just wants to deal with big creatures. And having an additional way to kill, you know, big creatures like Glorybringer or even Steel Leaf Champion is very important. And of course, you know, in the late game, you can just, you know, use the aftermath ability and fireball people out. Well, Beaumont Le Courier late to the party, but had the potential to bring gifts, ultimately, and a braid. Did deal with that one, though, so it's just this lonely Scrap Heap Scrounger coming along. Another copy in the graveyard that I would imagine we'll be seeing come back into Ooh, play soon enough. this is a big enough. one. 
Glory Bringer. Now, Glory Bringer, one of the cards that uh, sets apart Kazuki Takemura's list from that of Marcio Carvalho. Three copies for him in the main deck compared to just one for Marcio. And this is going to spell a big s set of swings here for Takemura, able to, if he wants, deal with that scrounger, or maybe he just feels like he's going to be good in a race another way. Yeah, but it looks like he opted not to attack here. He's actually losing the race here because Marcio did have a second copy of the Scrappy Scrounger on the board. And Kazuyuki is at eight life here. He'd rather keep that glory bringer back to, to keep those scrap heap scroungers at bay. And currently, Marcio has no other creatures in his graveyard. So Kazuyuki can, you know, hap w will happily block a scrounger and not have to worry about Marcio getting it back on the following turn. I mean, figuring out the race in this sort of scenario, it seems pretty complicated to me, Paul, when you've got the likes of uh, creatures that can't block on one side that you can kind of completely brick wall by holding back a big enough blocker. You've already got ribbons in a graveyard that represents still more damage. Uh, Heart of Kieran means that functionally whatever creature you draw may end up kind of having haste. Yeah. This is not an easy sort of a game to navigate. Yeah. And he does have access to kind of two blockers in a sense. Let's say Marcio drew something like an unlicensed disintegration on the glory bringer. Kazuyuki can still crew up the Heart of Kieran to block, give, uh, leaving the, uh, the glory bringer back. So Takamura draws and passes. He's got a card in hand now. And if you're Marcio, I guess that you think, well, even if it was a land, you might want to play it just so that you had more for that. Ribbons at some point, which suggests that there could be a quality removal spell coming for something that he has going on here. Yeah, I mean, this is super close. A lot of it just comes down to top decks at this point. It looks like both players are kind of out of resources. Marcio has the life advantage lead, but Kazuyuki does have a few more heavy hitters in his deck. But if Marcio is able to find a removal spell, he might be able to get through for the final few points of damage. And, you know, knowing what to do in tough situations like this is, I think, what separates just kind of your average player from world-class player, right? You know, when you pick up this deck for the first time, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm an aggressive deck. I'm just going to attack every time and then see what happens. Kazuyuki has shown multiple times that, you know, it's not always correct to attack. Even in his winning in, in the top, uh, into the top eight, he chose not to attack his Chain Whirler into a Champion of Wits because he knew that he could actually lock up the late game by, play, by eventually drawing into his Planeswalkers and if, uh, uh, so that Kevin Jones couldn't come back into the game by eternalizing the Champion of Wits. Now, Khan sign of Urza coming down. A big difference between these two lists and really what led us to uh, describe Takamura's deck as being a more mid-range example. He has Khan sign of Urza. He's immediately uh, ticked up the Planeswalker, getting to draw a card. There's a Magma Spray, sat with a Silver Counter on it, potentially for later. And I like what Khan does in this deck because obviously a source of card advantage is lovely, but actually this is also a list that can sometimes end up with a fair number of artifacts in play. And that means that the constructs created by Khan can also prove relevant threats. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the evolu evolution of that card. I think when it first came out, people was, were like, oh my god, you know, you get to draw a card every turn. This card is insane. But it's like, well, that's not always the case. You don't always get the card that you want right away. Uh, but, you know, it's really just, uh, you know, been proving its worth in decks with actual artifacts. I think that's where it really shines. You know, we, we see it in all these, uh, these various vehicles decks, and then you all, you've also seen it in the, uh, the blue-green card deck that was played by Team Ultra Pro Channel Fireball. Now, Marcio on five life. He's got a shock, so he's able to deal with that Heart of Kieran, but by, by my count, there are enough lands in play here that it may just be a matter of ribbons to close things out here. The Exerted Glorybringer won't be attacking this turn, but five points of damage needed, and Takimura carefully looking at what's going on in the graveyards here. Yeah, but now Kazuki has access. He's got that Silver Counter under Magma Spray. He can choose to just get that Magma Spray back, even if Marcio chooses to... Uh, you know, return the Scrap Heap Scrounger. So he's, he's in a really good spot here. Also, of course, the cut to ribbons uh, in the graveyard means that he can just, he basically just has this locked up. And you can see the smile on Takimura's face here. Obviously, going first in this sort of a matchup is something that was always going to be helpful for him. But, you know, on a Sunday in a Pro Tour, you, you just want to take your wins wherever you can get them. And <laughs> big, big smiles on his face as he takes down the very first game here. So that is our first game complete in our quarterfinals. Plenty more magic even before we get to the second set of quarterfinals here. We will be able to bring you updates from what's going on our back table soon enough. But first, these messages don't go anywhere. So Magic the Gathering Arena. We chose that word arena very particularly because an arena is a place where people gather, where people come to compete, where people come to spectate and cheer on their favorites. It really is a place where the whole community can come together and experience the very best of what Magic has to offer.
and welcome back to this, our first set of quarterfinals here at Pro Tour Dominaria. I'm Tim Willoughby. Calling the game with me is Paul Chion, and we've already seen our first game completed. Uh, uh, Kazuyuki Takemura picking up his game one against Marcelo Carvalho on the play, able to go a little bit over the top with some of his bigger threats in that game. They'll have another pre-sideboarded game before we get on to any more of that. But we also have another game going on in our uh, Whoa, quarterfinals look at that. here. <laughs> Those Bomac couriers, <laughs> they have brought a lot of gifts, but... At the moment, with no blockers, there's no reason for them to start even thinking there are about so many cards. actually delivering them. <laughs> look at that. That's yeah, I can't help but get all those look, cards look at on getting camera in there. there. Uh, that'll be a, a nice little memory for Gonzalo Pinto uh, of this game. <laughs> two life left for Ernest Lim, and facing down three attackers that between them, any two of them hitting in will be lethal. He's going to have to find something fast here for his Esper control deck if he's going to turn a corner here. When we talk about the control decks turning a corner, this is maybe a little bit too far, but worth noting that Pinto still only three lands in play compared to the six for Ernest Lim. Uh, so it may be that he's got a few cards stranded in hand right now. Yeah, and, and that's part of the reason why you see so many cards underneath these Bomac Couriers as well. So Torrential Gear Help comes along, and there is a cast down there to get rid of one of those Bomac Couriers. So this is going to put Ernest down to one after he blocks the Chain Whirler, and Gonzalo can have... And you can just have another Goblin Chain Whirler. Any Chain burn spell, any damaging effect, and there it is. All right, Chandra, Tortured Defiance. Late to the party, but showed up just in time to make sure that everything worked out there for Gonzalo Pinto. Picking up his game one. We are going to stay with this one so we can get a little bit of an idea of the uh, the landscape of how this matchup works because we have a very different matchup on our hands to what we saw on the front table here. Uh, Ernest Lim, the lone proponent of blue cards in this top eight, and I think that for that reason, if no other, he's probably got a fair few supporters around the world. If you control mages out there, have something to check out here. Control being the good guy for once in this tournament in a sea of goblin chain whirlers, so yes. Yeah, uh, Ernest Lim, he's, he's had a <laughs> smile on his face all weekend at 8-0 on day one. Fantastic start for him, and he was able to convert, you know, a couple of little wrinkles on day two, but uh, he, he had a great draft at the start of yesterday. Uh, was one of the variety of players in our featured draft yesterday that managed to open a Planeswalker. Not too bad if you're looking to find a way of making it into the top eight of the Pro Tour. And this is his, by far, his best finish that he's had thus far at the Pro Tour. Yeah, that was a crazy draft. I think there were four Planeswalkers opened in total in the, in the future draft on day two. Now, let's have a look at the deck list because Ernest, well used to playing with Planeswalkers, not just in that limited format, but in his constructed as well. At this point, these players, they're just shuffling up. There's no sideboarding to be done just yet. They're getting a feel for the pre-sideboarded game, two pre-sideboarded games before we go to sideboards. And... On the face of things, I would have thought the control deck pre-sideboard actually looks pretty good against Red Black. Yeah, I actually think that the control, if you just take a look at this deck, it has answers to basically most of the popular decks in the format. You have just the, the combination of good efficient removal along with the counter magic and then your inevitability and your very powerful finishers with the Gear Hulk, the Scarab God, and Teferi means that, it, I mean, it's really hard to find the correct angle, like a fair angle to defeat this deck. Um, I think where this deck might suffer is in post-board games, where like all your cards are already so good, so well set up in game one, you don't have as many good sideboard options as other decks do. Once the other decks board out all their, you know, a lot of their spot removal and turn them into duresses and planeswalkers, things change a lot. So yeah, I think Control is just considered kind of the best game one deck uh, in the current standard format. Now looking at the other side of things, uh, for Gonzalo Pinto here, He's got a lot of one-drops, and we actually saw the, those two Bomac Couriers that, by the looks of things, had been attacking in for essentially the entire game. Uh, and that's one of the ways that he can potentially go underneath what Ernest Lim has go on, going on. If he can get a little bit more damage in early, it does put a little bit more pressure on Lim's draws to find what he needs to get back into the game. And if he can't find those things, then, well, we see exactly as game one went that the red-black deck certainly has the potential to win game ones here. And we're essentially going to get a chance to see a second game one, if you will, um, between these two, uh, because they are, it looks like they're just about ready to kick things off in their game two. Currently, it is uh, Pinto who is a game up. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
you know, we I talked earlier about how, you know, the slightly more aggressive version, you get to play Bomag Courier. And that's, you know, might be a bit of a risk when you expect, let's say, a sea of red decks because, you know, there's going to be Goblin Chain Whirlers flying around all over the place. But when you, meet, you know, go up against that Blue-White Teferi deck, you know, or any other control deck, those one drops do a ton of work, specifically that Bomag Courier. I mean, we've seen Bomag Courier in the past just draw five, six, seven cards. Just be one of the best card draw engines out of that deck. And look at Pinto's hand here. This is the kind of hand that can punish a draw that starts off with a tapped land. Bomac Courier turn one, Bomac Courier two, two if he wants it, and then unlicensed disintegration if there is a, a blocker coming down for Ernest Lim anytime soon. Uh, Rekindling Phoenix, also a really fiddly creature to deal with, depending on exactly the removal that Ernest Lim has drawn into. Yeah. Now, Rekindling Phoenix has gotten... Well, no, it's still a great card. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there are... A lot of decks have adapted and have more answers now. I mean, if you look at the blue-white control decks, you have access to, you know, multiple seal aways along with cast out. And, of course, Teferi could also tuck the Rekindling Phoenix. And I would guess that most blue-black control decks play, you know, th four copies of Braska's Contempt. And uh, it looks like Ernest definitely does do that. So, you know, there, there are a few more answers, but... Um, yeah, it's still, it just kind of forces you to have it. So a syncopate coming down there to stop the second copy of Bomac Courier. Uh, two mana counter magic in relatively short supply that counters literally any spell in the format, though in this instance having to spend two mana to counter a one mana spell is not quite as exciting as you'd hope for. Anytime you're playing removal that costs less than the card that you're stopping, it feels great. Uh, this way around, a necessary evil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, syncopate, you know, it... it it's just the fact, I mean, the thing is, this, the late game for this deck is so powerful. The fact that you, if you just syncopate anything, you're pretty happy, even if you trade it down in mana. And exiling the card that gets countered, potentially very relevant, depending on exactly what you get. It wasn't as if Ernest was going to be waiting around for a Scrap Heap Scrounger, but dealing with the Bomac Courier, perfectly fine. Dealing with this second Bomac Courier, thanks to Fatal Push, he didn't get to draw the cards, or he's elected not to draw the cards, should I say. And that means that really... It was a Raging Goblin that he was up <laughs> against. And spoiler alert for you guys that are planning out how to build your aggro decks in the future, Raging Goblin typically not good enough. Yeah, and Exiling Creatures is important against the red-black aggro decks, specifically because of the card uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger. Uh, just making sure creatures aren't in the graveyard means that there's less fuel to get uh, you know, multiple activations of the Scrounger if it is in the graveyard. Now, it looks like Gonzalo is stuck on two lands here. He, did, he kept the two lander, so he's going to need to find a few more to get out of this. Well, there's an unglued mountain, and that means there's three mana, and plenty of options for this deck at three mana. Liking the Goblin Chain Willer, especially given it can immediately crew that Heart of Kieran if it resolves here, but four mana for Ernest Lim. He's got a few options to potentially stop it. No, it looks like the Goblin's in. That means that uh, Dad's car is coming on over. Four damage to Ernest Lim. Yeah, I think Ernest really wants to resolve this Glimmer of Genius in hand, so he's going to take the damage here. Yeah, I mean, that's the cost that you pay when you're playing control against these sorts of aggro decks, is that if you want to cast that Glimmer of Genius early, you are going to be having to take some damage to do so. Yeah, and, you know, I think people who are used to playing against control decks, that's when you uh, usually choose to play kind of your, your most powerful threats once they hit that four mana threshold. Oftentimes when they have three mana and they're keeping up disallow and can't do anything else, that's when you kind of try to bait the counter. But once you hit four mana and pa they pass with four mana up, you're like, yeah, I know you want to cast your Glimmer of Genius. This is where I'm going to like start pressuring you to, to make the decision whether or not you want to you know, counter my threat or cast your Glimmer. Because sometimes that Glimmer is really, really important to make sure you hit your land drops. So Ernest Lim at this stage in the game, he's at 13 life. At what sort of life total does Lim start worrying about uh, what's coming from the other side of the table? Um, you know... I think once you start getting down to the single digits, you start worrying about some combination of cards. But, you know, I, I, if, if I was in Ernest's situation here, I would feel pretty comfortable currently. You know, he resolved the Glimmer. He dealt with a couple of early threats. He's got a Teferi on the board. So really depends, of course, on the type of removal or interaction that he has in his hand. Yeah, Teferi coming down now and... That is effectively another Shield's downturn. Uh, not too much mana left available apart from what's been untapped. Fatal Push dealing with the Heart of Kieran. That a big interaction that we've seen all weekend long. Uh, but Goblin Chain Whirler continuing to get a little bit of good work done here. Gradually whittling down that life total of Ernest Lim here. Look at Teferi. Draw two cards, gain three life so far. 
I mean, all of those things seem great. <laughs> I mean, gaining the life against this red-black deck seems a pretty important piece of the puzzle. Ernest Lim, he's now up to six mana. And if we talk about four mana being a key point for where the control deck is able to start casting Glimmer of Genius, six is where Torrential Gearhulk also becomes a factor. And if we have a look at uh, the hand of uh, Lim, that wow. is three copies of Torrential Gearhulk. A lot Gearhulk of Gearhulks. And a whole lot of relevant cards in the graveyard. I like how this looks all of a sudden for Ernest Lim. He will have ways of meaningfully interacting with a lot of what is going on on the other side of the battlefield. Yeah, but Gonzalo, uh, but Ernest's removal uh, effect in his graveyard are two copies of Fatal Push, none of which are uh, which he can use to target the Chain Whirler or Rekindling Phoenix in the yard. And Gonzalo also has an unlicensed disintegration in hand, uh, which he could use to get rid of the Gear Hulk. Now imagine Ernest here is just going to play out the Gear Hulk here to block. Um, because now he's sitting at 13 life. Um, if, the cre if both creatures are going at the Teferi, I guess he could also choose to let it go. But I think, I, I, you know, you, you just, he doesn't really have any other good options. I think I would just play out the Gear Hulk, cast Glimmer Genius, try to find Vraska's Contempts, and, um, you know, kind of cross my fingers and, and hope that the disintegration is not here. I mean,. Any time that you're able to get multiple gear hulks into play, suddenly the creatures on the other side of the battlefield really don't look all that impressive. Right. Uh, there it was the t gear hulk into Glimmer of Genius. At some point, it may well be a gear hulk into a removal spell, at which point it can kind of be double removal if at least the gear hulk's able to block. Chainwell are down. Right, Admittedly, Teferi's also gone, but you know you can't have everything apparently. Yeah. Oh wow! Look at that. That's an efficient. Mana efficiency. <laughs> yeah, like you cast your Chandra, you immediately take her up to generate mana. That means that you've got the mana left to cast Cut. Uh, Torrential Gear Hulk has already taken some damage. Now, Cut, of course, is a sorcery, so it's not as if there was going to be able to be the cool do first strike damage and then kill off your Gear Hulk without losing my Chain Whirler. But I don't think that Gonzalo is going to be too unhappy with how that's played out. Getting a Planeswalker onto the battlefield, up and doing things, is pretty important against these control decks. Yeah, there is a lot of pressure now in Ernest to find that Vraska's Contempt. He needs to be, be able to deal with both the Chandra and the Phoenix here, and it looks like he hasn't found it yet. And Gonzalo, keep in mind, he used that cut on the Gear Hulk. He's still holding an dis unlicensed disintegration in hand um, for the second Ernest, uh, for the second Gear Hulk that Ernest might cast. And it doesn't look like he found a Contempt here either, so despite being way ahead on cards, Ernest hasn't really found the right answers for the current board state. Yeah, just a land drop for Ernest Lim here. And obviously these control decks do want to be hitting their lands. They have a lot to do with their mana in every stage of the game. Uh, but at the same time, right now it's Gonzalo Pinto who's really dictating the pace that we see this game go at. Yeah. And actually, this is kind of a, a weird situation because um, currently there's no real good target for Tarantula Gearhulk in the graveyard. So if he decides to play it, it won't really do a whole lot here. Let's take a look at what Ernest is working with here. He does have another Glimmer of Genius. He may be tempted to, to play it here in in the face of what's going on with that PNLR coming down. If he casts a Glimmer, he still has the mana to be able to stop it in a variety of different ways. Ooh, and Gonzalo choosing not to play PNLR. Going for the damage plan. Scrappy of Scrounger and Heart of Kieran, two very problematic permanents. Uh, neither of them straightforward to remove. One of them can, of course, dodge sorcery speed removal very easily. The other one comes back from the graveyard all too often. And well, now there's a target for the push. And Ernest can now attempt to pressure the Chandra here. He can't get rid of it, but he can deal five points of damage to the Chandra, getting it down to one. I mean, there's a potential here for Chandra to jump in Dad's car and... Uh, crew the Heart of Kieran. A nice play that I saw yesterday from Owen Turtenwald in response to Avraska's contempt on his uh, Chandra, using all of the loyalty on Chandra to crew a Heart of Kieran a lot of times in order to stop the life gain on the Vraska's contempt. Uh, being able to crew Heart of Kieran with Planeswalker loyalty, not something that we see too terribly often, but when it happens, it's often very powerful indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that is an option, but it does seem to me that that would be way too risky of a play because you would be taking a loyalty away from Chandra, and if Ernest has any removal for the heart of Kirin, then he effectively gets rid of the Chandra as well because it would go down to five loyalty. 
And you can see here now with each draw step, Ernest Lim kind of squeezing out that last card that he's drawn off the top of the deck. And that's the point where you know that these draws really matter. Being at 1-1 going into sideboarding, that's kind of okay. You get to play your sideboarded games and you, you still got a, a good puncher's chance. But 2-0 down against an aggro deck like this going into sideboarding, that is definitely problemsville. Yeah. Ernest, uh, kind of from the, the school of Yam Wing Chun with that slow squeeze every time he needs the draw. A favorite of uh, <laughs> cards in hand viewer uh, operators around the world. <laughs> and Gonzalo Pinto here, shoulder patches on his shirt, just casually looking on as uh, Ernest Lim figures out what he wants to do with this turn. Nice tweed tie there. I, I like how he's turned out for this one. I can appreciate Cleans that. Up nicely. Yeah, but this still isn't a great spot here because if you look at it, you know, on the following turn, Gonzalo is going to be able to plus Chandra, deal two points of damage to Ernest Lim, then remove a loyalty counter to get in for eight points of damage with both the Heart of Kieran and the Rekindling Phoenix. And th they're both evasive, and Ernest currently... I mean, what is he working with? I mean, he's got, he's got another Gear Hulk, so what he can do is Gear Hulk... Fatal push on the heart of Kieran, but Ernest will go down to one life off these attacks. But if you see that enchantment on the screen, Ernest Lim does have an Arguel's Bloodfast on the battlefield. And at the beginning of his upkeep, if you're at five or less life, you transform it. And when you transform Arguel's Bloodfast, it turns into a land where you can actually tap it to sacrifice a creature. And when you do, you gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness. And that's huge, because he's going to have two Torrential Gearhawks on the battlefield. Yeah, there, there's a lot of toughness that he has to work with here. He can potentially gain a lot of life. Um, he's not immediately dealing with lots of threats on the other side of the battlefield, but he may be able to tread water until he finds a way of doing so. Oh, I forgot, I forgot that Gonzalo still has that unlicensed disintegration in hand. So I think this is just going to be the game because Gonzalo is going to go for the lethal attack. Ernest is then going to go for the Gear Hulk, and Gonzalo has an artifact on the battlefield. He's just going to play the unlicensed disintegration, and Ernest is going to go down to two, take a hit from the Rekindling Phoenix, and that should be the game. Yeah. So here we have Pinto. No need to reveal more than he has to. So he goes for the straightforward line here, which would win him the game, assuming nothing from Ernest Lim. And Lim, you can see. You know, a little bit of visual math, I like to call it, you know, just tapping out on the table, figuring out how much damage he might be taking from different points here. He's up against the wall. He's got to do something here. Yeah, and th this is kind of the one issue with, or some of the problems you can run into uh, when choosing to play kind of the more blue-black heavy version of this. So okay. A cycle into Vraska's wow. Contempt. Wow, that he was found like a, a, a really nice sequence for him there. Vraska's Contempt to get rid of a key creature and gain life. As things stand, though, Unlicensed Disintegration oh, does have a target. And with a tapped out Ernest Lim, I believe that this may mean that going into sideboards, it is Gonzalo Pinto who is well ahead here. Two games to zero thus far for Gonzalo Pinto. If we were in the Swiss, that would be the end of our match. But no, sir, we have at least one more game from those two. And now we're going to get a chance to see another game from Kazuki Takamura and uh, Marcio Carvalho back on our other quarterfinal matchup. So just as a little reminder for you, it was Takamura who was able to take, um, take the first game here. I believe. Yeah, and Gonzalo needs to, has to be thrilled that he's up 2-0. I mean, obviously anybody would be up 2-0, but this is the matchup where I think going in, he, didn't necessarily, he probably necessarily didn't feel like a favorite in game one, right? The control decks generally are favored uh, in a lot of these matchups, at least in game ones. And after Cyborg, Gonzalo has so many more answers. You know, just, just the addition of, you know, duress and doomfall makes it that much harder um, to, to just kind of, you know, play with a handful of counters. You can just play around. You have perfect information. You can just play around all the different counters that they have. Um, not to mention, you know, additional copies of Planeswalkers. So, yeah, Consola being up 2-0, yeah, he's a gigantic favorite going in because I think he is favored post-board. As things stand, though, here we have uh, Kazuyuki Takamura. There you see him, a Pro Tour winner, uh, just 
awaiting the final decisions here from Marcelo Carvalho. We can see Carvalho's hand, kind of an interesting one. He's not got anything to do before turn three and just the two lands in hand. So the draw of Scrap Heap Scrounger there off the top of his deck, a very important one, meant that he's able to curve out kind of nicely. But he will still be hoping to find more lands very soon because a Scrap Heap Scrounger alone, not too potent. And we know that Takamura actually has three copies of Magma Spray in his deck, which oh, is pretty much the land. ideal uh, way of dealing with this sort of thing. Very, very important. Starts things off with the Goblin Chain Whirler here. Knowing Kazum Kazuyuki Takemura's list, there's no real need to try and uh, play a different three drop and wait on maybe getting a little bit more value from that Chain Whirler. Very little that's going to get killed off by the Chain Whirler in uh, this matchup, as it turns out. I think Kazuyuki has two P in LRs. That's like the only card. I mean, there is a P in the LR here, but we also know that there are more copies of uh, Goblin Chain Whirler in hand for Marcio Carvalho. And he's drawn yet another land. This is perfect for Marcio Carvalho, looking to bounce back after having lost that game one. Yeah, those two lands were huge. Now he can just play out the, um, the Rekindling Phoenix in hand, and now he will have the, the Rekindling Phoenix advantage, if you will. Yeah, back when we were first looking at mono red decks, uh, it was Hazaret the Fervent that was the big four drop that everyone was excited about. Hazaret's kind of fallen out of favor a little bit these days. Um, there are just so many other good things that make it difficult to get rid of the cards in your hand. Uh, instead, Rekindling Phoenix taking uh, a little bit more of a center stage, if you will. Uh, the 4 3 fly that just will not die, uh, certainly giving a lot of reach and uh, sustained ability to deal damage to these red decks. Yeah, well, I think just based on the fact that a lot of these red-black decks have chosen to slow down a little bit, go up the curve, play Chandra's, Karns, Glorybringers, oftentimes you're just, your hazards are not actually going to be able to attack. I think, you know, it's, it is at its best when you can just empty out your hand and play a turn four and attack. So, you know, that's something that you see more out of the straight mono-red Blitz aggro decks as opposed to these, you know, kind of more mid-rangey red-black Decks. Now, Kazuki uh, Takimura, his unlicensed disintegration is not quite wow. as potent because he doesn't have as many artifacts. One artifact he does have is a single copy of that Walking Ballista, but the 2 2 Walking Ballista, while it's safe from Goblin Chain Whirler, not so safe from an Exerted Glory Ringer. And these exactly the kind of cards that you would be looking to draw if you were uh, planning out how you wanted this game to go. Let's have a turn two Scrap Heap Scrounger, turn three Chain Whirler, turn four Phoenix, turn five Glory Bringer. Are there any decks in the format that can feel comfortable against that kind of draw? A control deck, I would say. <laughs> you know, a control deck with, with counter magic, seal away, settle the wreckage would be able to handle this, but most other decks, no. It would be very, very difficult. And Marstrio drew kind of like the, the more top end ver part of his deck. He didn't draw any of his one drops. And if he doesn't do that, they're basically kind of playing out the same, the same style of deck. Takimura here, looking at a life total of 5 to 18 and a board where he now has a Chandra, but his opponent has. So many different threats. Uh, ticks up Chandra so that he's able to pass <laughs> Goblin Chain Whirler. Please have nothing. And there's a Chain Whirler. That's the additional point. And that's enough to square things up. Kazuki Takamura and Marcio Carvalho going into their sideboarded games. They are even Stevens, one game apiece. And now they get a chance to go to those sideboards, make some spot adjustments, try and find a way of eking out the win, advancing into the uh, semi-finals here. And we're going to get a chance to head back to see Ernest Lim and uh, Gonzalo uh, Pinto. I believe that they're still shuffling. That's how quick that game was on the other side of the, uh, of the table. We're going to get to see all of the games from here on out uh, in this first set of quarterfinals. We're going to be jumping in between so that hopefully we have very little of the shuffling and absolutely all that we can of the magic itself. Yeah, let's take a look here with what Ernest would potentially look to board in. Don't think he's bringing in the Glintsleeve Siphoners. There is a Settle the Wreckage in the sideboard, which is a little bit ambitious given his mana base, not a lot of white sources. Um, there's an extra cast down and uh, a bunch of negates and duresses. So, you know, I've had the opportunity to play with this control deck a little bit, and it has been very difficult to sideboard against the red black deck because they have so many different angles of attack. They have the vehicles, they have the planeswalkers, they have, you know, uh, a bunch of random creatures as well. So it's like, you know, if if you're playing a deck with a bunch of different types of counters, it's really hard to sideboard. Also, holding a hand full of counters 
is not great when they know exactly what you have after Cyborg because they can just duress you and play around them. Yeah, now this particular list uh, from Pinto, it's got both Duris and Doomfall in the sideboard, uh, two copies of each, uh, and that means that he's got the potential to rip apart hands, but indeed also uh, deal with creatures if need be. Scrappy Scrounger coming down on turn two for Pinto here. Nice to have some early source of damage, just so that even if you end up playing a slightly more controlling role, you've got that consistent clock going on as well. Yeah, you still have to have some pressure to keep them honest, because you don't want to play a full-on control matchup against them. But, you know, a lot of the creatures that Gonzalo has are just in incredibly resilient creatures that spot removal isn't very good against. You know, cards like the Scrap Heap Scrounger and the Rekindling Phoenix, those are just cards you're happy to have. He might, even, he might have even brought in those Siege Game Commanders because you really you need to have a Sweeper to actually have that be good. And, oh man, how bad does it feel to cast Settle the Wreckage on Siege Game Commander tokens? Oh my. Yeah, not ideal. And after sideboarding, there are ways for this red-black deck to actually utilize all that mana. Um, I mean, Siege Gang Commander also quite good after Settle the Wreckage because <laughs> you have all of that mana to be able to start potentially immediately sacrificing goblins if you so choose. Right. Disallow in hand here for uh, Ernest Lim was able to stop a Heart of Kieran, and now he's up to uh, four mana. So as we spoke about in the previous game, a few more options available to him. It looks like Teferi might be coming along in the future with that Ether Hub, just enough mana fixing to mean that he's going to be able to cast the Planeswalker as and when it comes along. Wow. It's a lot of action. Yeah, big duress here from Gonzalo Pinto. He's going to get to look at the hand of Ernest Lim, and almost everything will be a reasonable target for this duress. It's taking non-creature, non-land cards, and if you're control, that's essentially most of your cards. Right. Mm. Let's take a look at Ernest's hand and see what he's working with to figure out what Gonzalo's going to play around. Um, Gonzalo still needs to find that fourth land. He was holding that Chandra Torch of Defiance, but really does want to find that extra mana source. He even has a, Sh um, a Goblin Chain Whirler in hand, but he drew his one sideboarded swamp, so he can't actually play his Chain Whirler. Yeah, a li little rough there, though. <laughs> the Chain Whirler conveniently not exactly awful even in that spot. So Vraska's Contempt getting played there, and we can see what's left of the hand of uh, Slim, Scarab God, uh, Field of Ruin, Ether Hub. To Fairy Hero of Dominaria, very quickly put in the graveyard because that was the only legal target once that Vraska's Contempt had resolved. And it's kind of interesting how, you know, Ernest decided to go with the Scarab God here, which hasn't seen as much play recently. You know, peop people were going crazy about it before. And, um, you know, I think with the, you know, everybody just deciding to play more Vraska's Contempts and cast outs and sealways, it was just not doing as well. But, you know, if left uncontested, the Scarab God will end the game very quickly. Yeah, a very potent magic card indeed. And it looks like, you know, the jig is up. Uh, Gonzalo Pinto's seen everything that's going on in Eslin's hand, more or less. There it and is. So throws down the Scarab God. It has the ability to block that Scrap Heat Scrounger if he so choose, though that might be a little risky. Um, five Toughness, a secretly uh, powerful ability against this red deck that has a number of good ways of getting to four damage between your Chandra, between um, cuts of ribbons and so on and so forth. But actually, five damage means that you might be having to layer up a couple of different spells in order to kill off the god. And even then, the god's coming back. And that's kind of a problem. Yeah, five, five is, in fact, the magic number against... Um Against a lot of these red decks, I mean, Gonzalo does have access to those disintegrations, and you know he might have considered not keeping them in against the traditional blue-white control deck that we saw all weekend. But against the blue-black deck with all these Gear Hulks and the Scarab Gods, I imagine he kept all of them in. Yeah, these players do work with the benefit here in our top eight of full deck lists, and I'm sure that there will have been a fair amount of testing going on into the evening. Maybe not by these guys directly; they may have uh, deputized some of their teammates to get an idea of the matchup while they're getting a good night's sleep. But one way or another, they will be very much aware of the details of exactly what forms of interaction will be coming from each, each other. Wait, wh what happened? Oh, I see what happened. So if you're wondering why that Scrap Heap Scrounger didn't attack after the Unlicensed Disintegration, what happened was Gonzalo, at the end of his turn, cast Unlicensed Disintegration on the Scarab God. So Ernest doesn't actually get the trigger from the Scarab God until the end of his turn, meaning that he can't actually cast that Scarab God until the following turn. So uh, pretty heads up play there. Pretty very interesting uh, line of sequencing there from Gonzalo. Yeah, kind of a tempo play, I guess. And at this point, with the life totals being as high as they are, 
he will be seeing that Scarab God again. It's just yes. a matter of how much he can do with that time in the meantime. Cast his Chandra Torture Defiance. That resolves plus one and does two damage to Lim with the ability there, exiling Kari Zev. No matter to cast that one. And now it's going to be a matter of whether or not Lim actually wants to cast his Scarab God or if he decides that there might be a better option now he's facing down a Planeswalker in addition to that Scrap Heap Scrounger. Yeah, and if you take a look at Gonzalo's hand, Angrath, the Flame Chained, is sitting in his hand. So if Ernest chooses to play this Scarab God, Gonzalo can play Angrath and steal it to get in for a lot of damage. Yeah, a really interesting addition to these sideboards, Angrath, able to do a lot of work. Um, I mean, just having more Planeswalkers against control, if you can figure out a way of resolving them, ends up being a fine way of winning the game. You're not necessarily trying to be a full control deck, but just provide more different angles of attack that means that it's more difficult for your opponent to scrabble around and defend against all of them. Right. So Dragon Skull Summit, the pickup here for Pinto. He's looking on at an opponent with a lot of untapped lands, though. We can see that uh, Lim there, he's got his copy of the Scarab God upside down in his hand. That's basically his way of reminding himself that his opponent knows that it's there. Right. Yeah, oftentimes in testing, you you know, w if your opponent knows of a card that you have, you just kind of leave it face up. And yeah, Ernest is just doing the heads up thing here, too. And I think this is very smart. And, you know, more people should do this. So... Pinto here, I like his sequencing. He's basically doing all of the things that he was going to do at some point this turn anyway first before he starts committing any mana to any spells, meaning that he's got the most ability to respond to whatever happens from Ernest Lim's side of the battlefield. Lim now on nine with these attacks coming from Scrap Heap Scrounger. Yeah, and I don't think Gonzalo is interested in playing the Angrath right now, given that Ernest has all access to all this mana. So... Um, I thought he was going to run out maybe a Chain Whirler, but it looks like he's he's choosing not to play anything. At least for now, this Glimmer yeah. of Genius coming along. Two oh, this might be still mid-attack. Yeah, two right, lands right, being right. put to the bottom here. Uh, Syncopate being one of the pickups, and that, of course, a very potent counter if there's going to be some post-combat magic. Uh, six life left for Ernest Lim after that attack. Not too much to work with, especially with the face of that Chandra and uh, Scrap Heat Scrounger on the battlefield. Uh, but the syncopate's so awkward here. Consolo can just play out a Goblin Chain Whirler and will not get syncopated as he does have the two mana available. Yeah, syncopate, fantastic on turn two, uh, on the play especially. Um, but yeah, as you say, Paul, this Chain Whirler coming down, syncopate won't be good enough. Can't quite make out everything that's going on in, um, in Lim's hand here. Let's see whether or not we can get a bit of info. A Settle the Wreckage, which you can set up for over a turn or two, but right now, his life total low enough, but thanks to the, you know, the pings from that Chain Whirler, the attacks from the Scrounger, and of course Chandra, that it may be a little bit cute to try and hold back the Settle the Wreckage and hope that that's going to be good enough to keep him alive for long enough. Yeah, the problem is Ernest really needs to just find a way to deal with that Chandra on the board, and currently he doesn't have anything. Um, you know, he, he needs to, like, be able to put more cr creatures onto the battlefield. He could look at the Scarab God or Torrential Gearhulk, but, yeah, that's Chandra, the three ticks, and that's it. I guess Torrential Gearhulk into Vraska's Contempt does work for Chandra, but doing so d taps you very low indeed. Yeah, is there a Vraska's Contempt? Oh, okay, there, there, there is, okay. Yeah, our key graveyard cards right now, we've got some counter magic, we've got some removal, we've got some card drawing. That's everything that a control deck ought to want. Uh, I guess that the extra secret thing that these control decks are always looking for, enough mana to do everything that they so desire. And right now, Ernest Lim, even with all of those lands in play, eight lands in play, if he's casting Torrential Gear Hulk, he's not got much left in the tank for whatever comes next. From, yeah, and there's a Sala lot of Contact. pressure for Ernest to main phase this so that he doesn't take that damage from the Chandra. But um, it looks like he's choosing to take an additional two points of damage here um, just for the surprise factor of being able to ambush one of these creatures. He, you know, if he main phases it and Gonzalo does not have a removal effect, he's not going to attack. So this way, you know, he takes two, but he gets to save a little more. He saves one point of damage, basically, by choosing to wait for Gonzalo to attack. And I guess that uh, Ernest Lim also won kind of a virtual seven because when that uh, Vraska's Contempt resolves, he will gain a, a couple more points of life. Yeah, so so here, I mean, he can go for the Settle the Wreckage here if he wants. Is that what he's going to do instead? Looks like he's going in that direction. He's going to have to spend <laughs> a point of energy to do so. 
the one of. I kind of, I, I like the one ofs even more once you hit uh, top eight where your opponent knows your list because <laughs> it, it's, it's almost Max like... Max tilt. Well, I mean, if you're playing against uh, an Esper control deck in the Swiss and you don't know the exact list, then you may respect uh, Settle the Wreckage a little bit more because you might think they have three, maybe four copies in the list. Uh, once you know for a fact that there's only one copy and it's a sideboard card, at that point, how much do you really play around it? Right. So settle the wreckage, meaning a couple more copies of Mountain in play for Gonzalo Pinto. In addition to being well-dressed, I feel like his deck is well-dressed here with those uh, unglued basics. Uh, up to seven loyalty now on Chandra, though, revealing Ooh. a doomfall. This is tempting. Looks like he is going for the damage here. We, of course, know that there were some juicy targets in hand for that Doomfall. As things stand, goes for the post-combat uh, Goblin Chain Weller. That one gets hit by a Syncopate. Okay, and Ernest has to feel a lot safer now. I think he's probably, this, the, you know, he ha at this point he has to go for Torrential Gear Hulk on Vraska's Contempt on Chandra. But then Gonzalo can play the Angrath, steal Torrential Gear Hulk for the win. Yeah, because the Vraska's contempt will put Ernest up to five life, and I think Ernest really needs to needed to find something like a negate to be able to counter a follow-up planeswalker here. Yeah, the the hand for uh, Ernest Lim here. Yes, he's got uh, the Scarab God and Torrential Gearhulk. Unfortunately, the second copy of Scarab God in his hand, not quite as exciting <laughs> as the first. Yeah, this is going to be exactly lethal. Gonzalo just needs to play that Angrath, and the only card Ernest can have to interact here is a Negate. There's there it Angrath is. The Flame Chain. Don't worry about the plus one. Let's have a look <laughs> at the minus three ability on Angrath the Flame Chain. Gain control of target creature until the end of the turn. Untap it. It gains haste. Yeah, sacrifice it at the end of the turn if it costs three or less. But you know what? We're not going to get to the end of the turn. We're getting to the end of the entire match here. As Gonzalo Pinto. Decides to go down to one loyalty on that Angrath. I think that we can respect that decision. And <laughs> Ernest Lim just double checking again. What does it do? Yeah, a big deal here as Gonzalo Pinto able to pick up the uh, copy of Torrential Gear Hulk, swing in, and there's the handshake. We have our first semi finalist, Gonzalo Pinto of Portugal. He will be playing in the next round with his red black deck. And you know what that means? No more counter magic in this top eight. Nope. Only Goblin Chain Whirlers. All right, so that means that we're going to get a chance to jump back to uh, having a look at Kazuyuki Takemura and Masio Carvalho. Uh, each of these players has got a win under their belt already. It's just going to be a matter of who, after sideboarding, is going to be able to find a couple more in order to join Gonzalo Pinto on the second stage of this quest towards a Pro Tour trophy here on Sunday in Richmond, Virginia. So these guys just kicking off their game two. It is now uh, back to being Takimura on the play here. And I imagine after sideboarding, these decks are going to look even more similar. I think Marcio is probably going to slow down and just bring in uh, his top end cards as well to kind of match uh, Takimura. Scrap Heap Scrounger from Takimura. Nothing yet from Marcio Carvalho. There is the potential that these lists will have got a little bit uh, more controlling, if you will, after sideboarding. And it looks like we got a uh, some some sideboard here, sideboard technology. We got Marcio here bringing in two copies of Doom Doomfall, Chandra's Defeat, Glorybringer, a Braid, Swamp, Ether Sphere Harvester, and two Siege Gang Commanders. And yes, he did take out the four copies of Bomac Courier, Shock, Unlicensed Disintegration, Cut to Ribbons, and actually took out two Chandra Torture Defiances as well. So he took out Cut to Ribbons. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, two copies of Cut to Ribbons being added by uh, Kazuyuki. Huh. So he has uh, an additional uh, Hazaret. He's got Vraska's Contempt. He's got Chandra's Defeat. No big surprises there. Uh, taking out Walking Ballista, Unlicensed Disintegration, Heart of Kieran, taking out Chandra Torture Defiance. Um, I'm kind of intrigued at the removal of Chandra on both sides here. Can you talk me through that one, Paul? 
Well, both sides do uh, basically go up to, uh, b both sides do have many copies of kind of Glorybringer. And also, Marcio does have Sean. Okay, so for Marcio's side, he does have Chandra's defeat in a sideboard. So, you know, uh, there, you already have a lot of top end threats. And, uh, have, uh, you know, having a four drop or five drop that just immediately dies to that is not something that you necessarily want. Um, so that is why they look to take that out. All right. Well, the first uh, rekindling phoenix from uh, Marcio Carvalho being dealt with by that uh, Vraskin's Contempt. The second one that comes down, we'll see how that gets on. Right now, it's very much Kazuyuki Takimura who is... Um, leading this one in terms of life totals. There are some matchups where life totals are not necessarily a good indicator of who's winning. I would not say that that's the case in this particular matchup. Uh, 22 to 10, very much favoring Kazuyuki Takimura here as he looks on on the Rekindling Phoenix on the other side of the battlefield. Both these players have land, both have spells. Let's have a look at the cards in hand for each of these players. Takimura, he has Khan Sinoverza, cut to ribbons and a braid. He's got ways of dealing with the opposing creatures, generating card advantage, even a scrap peep scrounger in the graveyard. Meanwhile, on the other side of things, well, we've got more Rekindling Phoenix from Marcio Carvalho. That's kind of the big exclamation point on his hand. There is an Abrade. There's an unlicensed disintegration currently without any artifact in play, though a Scrap Heap Scrounger in hand could mean that that changes around relatively quickly. Three cards. Okay, so we have Marcio Carvalho here just slowing things down a touch. He's just going to have to try and make things work here. Life totals 18 to 10, and does throw down that copy of Scrap Heap Scrounger, gradually building up the kind of board that means that he's going to be able to get something going here. Unfortunately for him, that Scrounger, it's not going to be doing any blocking at all, ever. It can't block, that's just part of the rules. And uh, it looks like Kazuyuki Takimura happy to be attacking here. The abrade, though, from Marcio Carvalho, enough to deal with that chain weather, making sure that, at least for now, it is only Marcio with more uh, threats of damage on the battlefield. Let's see what uh, Takimura can do about that. Goes for Khan. Now, Khan, an interesting one here, because it is open to getting hit by all of those creatures on the other side of the battlefield, only granting a mountain immediately, suggesting that there might be a little bit of removal somewhere in Takimura's hand in order to make sure that his big sign of Urza stays safe for just a little bit longer. Uh, Marcio Carvalho here sending everything at the Planeswalker, respecting the fact that there must be something to come from the other side of the battlefield, and there it is in a braid on the Scrap Heap Scrounger. Now that Scrounger will come back, but in the meantime, Takimura's life total looking uh, a lot healthier due to the fact that he's not taking those hits himself. Two copies of Rekindling Phoenix coming down, and that means that uh, it's going to be really tough for Khan to stay in play here. And instead of using it to draw more cards, Kazuyuki Takimura simply removing the silver counter on the Vraska's Contempt already under Khan, because Vraska's Contempt almost the perfect answer to Rekindling Phoenix. There's already one in the Exiled Zone due to the big removal spell, and it would not surprise me at all to see that second one played on the second Rekindling Phoenix, making sure that we end up with uh, a healthy life total for Takimura and indeed uh, one less Rekindling Phoenix to worry about. Uh, Kazuyuki Takimura here gradually getting a feel for each of the threats on the other side of the battlefield, uh, counting down the really key threats that he has to deal with, making the most of the fact that at least for now he's got that life total advantage. Scrappy Scrounger coming back here, and Vraska's Contempt in response to Rekindling Phoenix down. And Takimura, his life total largely unfettered by what's been going on from Marcio Carvalho in the early stages of this game. It's not here until Glorybringer comes along that he actually is going to find himself sub-20 for any great length of time. Very aggressive attack too here. Yeah, Khan, Khan getting taken down. Yes, Scrap Heat Scrounger coming back, but right now at least Kazuki Takimura not threatening too terribly much damage. Uh, we will see whether or not there was something in hand that was lurking for him. No, doesn't look like it. He is playing kind of the control role here. Got the cut to ribbons in hand, which will be very, very good with the amount of lands that he has in play here. He uh, just needs to survive here. Marshall is trying to turn it around, but how much mana does he have? He has enough to 
to ribbons for lethal next turn, right? He, he can ribbons for lethal next turn. The big worry for Kazuyuki Takemura would be if there was a, another threat that was going to be able to mean that there were attacks in. But that Goblin Chain Whirler, it will block the Scrap Heap Scrounger all day long. And that means that Takemura, on the play each game, he's just found himself in great shape. And I guess that if after sideboarding, both of these decks are looking to become a little bit more controlling, the deck that started off a little bit more controlling already in really good shape. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Kazuyuki opted to bring in more copies of Cut to Ribbons in this matchup, whereas Marshall took, all of, took his out. And Kazuyuki is now going to win off the Cut to Ribbons. I wonder if that's going to make Marshall rethink um, kind of, you know, whether or not he wants to bring that back in. Takimura here just... Looking on as Marcio Carvalho lines up his cards, tries to find a way of uh, getting out of this. He, uh, I guess that the weird bit here is that all of the information that Marcio Carvalho needs is right on out there. He can work off the fact that, yes, with the status quo, he will <laughs> lose to that uh, ribbons. He just needs to figure out a way that there's anything he can do to change that. So, unlicensed disintegration, that's three points of damage, and he's now attacking he's so for close. Oh, a heartbreaker there. Not quite able to make it work. <laughs> and there's the big aftermath. This is the biggest ribbons I've ever seen. Ribbons for eight. That's how you race. That's how you win game two. Kazuyuki Takimura just one more game away from defeating Marcio Carvalho, who has a lot of top eight experience at the Pro Tour, has never lifted a Pro Tour trophy, though. Turns out that Takimura, with that one Pro Tour <laughs> win, he is still hungry to get a few more. We can see our back table there. That one's all complete. Uh, for those of you that uh, maybe joined a little bit later, uh, we already have our first semi-finalist in Gonzalo Pinto. And now we're going to get a chance to have a look at the sideboards of both uh, Kazuyuki Takimura first up here, and, and we will see Marcio Carvalho soon enough. Now, those two copies of Cut to Ribbons in the sideboard for Takimura we don't know whether or not it was the one that was already in his main deck or one of the ones on the sideboard that ultimately closed the game out, but they seem pretty good there to me, uh, Paul. I'm really intrigued as to the differing options that have been taken by um, Takimura versus his opponent here. Well, you know, if you take a look at kind of how this red deck has evolved and kind of turned into this red-black deck, uh, you know, the original mono-red aggressive deck started out with a bunch of haste creatures. And when you're facing down a bunch of haste creatures, you need to make sure all your removal is instant speed. But as the deck has slowed down, if you take a look at both of these decks, I mean, there's the only haste creature that you see is Glorybringer. And well, Cut to Ribbons is a good way, is, a, is a still a good way to deal with Glorybringer as well. So, you know, it's not that bad. You know, it's, it's still, you know, you're, you're going to be able to trade up on mana a decent amount of the time. And then when the games go late and both sides are just using all their removal spells to get rid of all the threats, this can just end the game. You know, it gives you that mana sink in the late game. And that's exactly what we saw here. You know, Martial was very close to turning that corner. You know, he was going to win if that cut to ribbons was any other removal spell. Yeah, interesting stuff. And let's have a look at what's going on on the other side of things. I think the card that stands out to me as being a really interesting one in the sideboard here, and it is one that's been brought in by Marcio Carvalho, is that Siege Gang Commander. It did great work in standard the first time around that it was printed. Siege Gang Commander's back, and I kind of like what it has going on in this matchup. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Seizing a Commander is an incredibly powerful card. Uh, you know, it's it's a little bit interesting that, you know, this is like an option that you bring in for this matchup, despite the fact that, you know, there's always that chance of getting Goblin Chain Whirlered. But I think also the idea is, well, you know what? If you, play, if you were going to play Chain Whirler, you likely would have played it before turn five. And if that happens, then I can get you with the Siege King. Because, you know, like we saw before, you just saw removal spells flying back and forth. But removal spell, not so great against a creature that makes three tokens to kind of live to tell the tale. Yeah, and of course, if you absolutely have to, functions as a burn spell as well. You get right. to cast your Siege Gang Commander. If you've got enough mana, you can start sacrificing tokens, uh, sacrificing Goblin Chain Whirlers if you really need to, sacrificing Siege Gang Commanders if you really, really need to, uh, to get the final points of damage. And I, it's something I've actually seen uh, a fair amount of from Marcio Carvalho over the course of this tournament, using that Siege Gang Commander to get the last few points of damage in after a successful attack step. Yeah, that's what I really that's what I really want to see. I want to see a siege gang commander flinging a goblin chain whirler for lethal. I can do it. Yeah. All right, these guys drawing their opening hands. Marcio Carvalho, he's going to have to win the next two games on the bounce because 
Kazuyuki Takimura, he has already picked up two of the three wins that he needs to be able to advance to the next stage in our elimination stages here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Takimura, little hand on the head there, just thinking through what he wants to be doing with uh, this opening hand. You know, I'm sure both players have a ton of experience with how this matchup plays out. Not only did they, of course, have the evening to prepare for the matchup, but you know, this was one of the basically the big decks with the target on its head going into the tournament. So, I'm sure countless hours were spent playing, you know, both pre-board and post-board games. Both players keeping their opening seven. Hazaret the fervent, the first draw for Kazuyuki Takimura, and Hazaret was one of those cards that, in the good old days of mono red, did Kazuyuki keep a one lander? It looks like he did. Oh. And while he had the Magma Spray for that first uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger, that's going to make life very difficult for him if he's oh, not able no. to get something going very fast. He's got Chandra's Defeat for Goblin Chain Whirler, but there can't be that many one-mana answers that he has going. And meanwhile, Marcio Carvalho, he just gets to uh, play Solitaire Magic here. <laughs> only one person wins in those sorts of games. Yeah. Uh, Rekindling Phoenix uh, now no coming land. along. Four, for four draws. I mean, if you see, this is kind of the reason why he kept his hand. He did have the one land with the two one mana removal spells, but still. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a dangerous spot anytime you keep a one land hand, and we see exactly why right now. Uh, yet another non land draw, and that means mm. that we have a very, very quick uh, game for Carvalho there. Not <laughs> Look at what he's, he's with that sigh of relief. He's like, what just happened? All right, yeah, I'll take I mean, the free win. Yeah, winning two on the bounce, really rough. <laughs> but now you know what? This could be anybody's game. Uh, we have one game to decide everything here. It will either be Kazuyuki Takimura. He'll be on the play. Um, and it may be that we see some slight sideboarding adjustments simply based on that play draw decision. Right. Um, and then ultimately, that's going to be the end of it. We're going to have just the first half of our quarterfinals all done. Yeah. And, you know, that's really rough. Yeah, I know the game, the matchup's all about kind of being able to deal with all your opponent's threats. Takimura had a few removal spells. But at the end of the day, after sideboard, his the curve of his deck is so high. He doesn't really want to miss land drops until he gets to four or five lands. So, you know, despite the fact that you had a couple of one-mana removal spells, still keeping that one lander seems a bit dicey. Yeah, I mean, both of these decks running a fair amount of land, uh, 24 land in the main deck for Marcio Carvalho, and I believe it's 25 land in the main deck for uh, Kazuyuki Takemura. And I think that actually after sideboarding, Marcio going up a land. So both of these decks with 25 lands. I know that there's a temptation for a lot of you building decks at home to cut on a land so you can have one more additional spell to uh, be able to do the fun bit of magic. But you know what? It's not fun at all if you can't cast your spells. Kazuyuki Takimura did not have a good time that game whatsoever. Play a few extra lands. It, in the long run, Flood doesn't hurt nearly as much as looking in that hand that's taunting you that you can never cast anything from. Yeah, and also especially in this format where you know you have those duels that cycle, right? Like just play more lands because you know if, if you do get flooded, Oftentimes, you're going to have one of those sitting in your hand, and you can cycle those away for a card. So, Marcio Carvalho now. The door open for him to be able to uh, make it through to these semifinals, where mere minutes ago, it seemed like a very, very tough struggle indeed for him. Worth noting, though, that thus far, every game has gone with the play. It's not something that I necessarily think is, you know, we, we don't have a significant uh, number of matches under our belt here in this top eight just yet. But at the same time, that's at least one small consolation for Kazuyuki Takimura going into this our deciding game here. Yeah, I mean, the value of these Planeswalkers or even just a lot of these threats is so much more important when you're on the play, when you're the aggressor, when you're putting pressure on the opponent. Now, it looks like uh, Takimura having had a questionable keep, shall we say, uh, on game four, has gone for a mulligan in game five. Mm. Once bidden, twice shy, maybe, uh, about those hands that don't quite look like they have enough to work with. Looks like Marcy was happy with his seven. All right, six cards to work with. Let's hope that this match does not finally get decided by too many mulligans. Oh, dear. Okay. I see two lands. So here comes the scry. 
These guys will be kicking off shortly. A scry to the bottom here. And just one of those lands. They're coming in play tapped here. Not too big a worry for uh, Takimura. His deck, not one that has too many one drops anyway. A one drop in hand for Marcio Carvalho here in Soulscar Mage. One advantage of Mulligan, I mean, one small consolation to Mulligan for Kazuyuki is one of the cards in his hand was Hazard the Fervent, and, uh, you know, increases the chances that he's going to be able to get that out and have it attack uh, earlier. The tactical. Uh, <laughs> the tactical Mulligan. Uh, so Heart of Kieran facing down against the Scrap Heap Scrounger now. Of course, the Scrounger, the only creature that can attack just yet. And a Goblin Chain Weller to follow means that Marcio Carvalho on 16 life going into his third turn here. If he's got almost any creature, though, then that uh, Heart of Kieran will be able to swing in. A lot of creatures with the requisite no amount of power uh, that they can put on the battlefield to make that crew work. In this case, PNLR uh, on her own can't drive Kieran's car, but with the help from a Thopter, they can figure it out and, and get some attacks in here. Yeah, and I don't think Marcio is interested in attacking with Heart of Kieran here. I think he wants to, you know, play the longer game here, use the Heart of Kieran to potentially block. Makes Kazuyuki sense. is down a card, so I think Marcio might be more inclined to just be able to trade resources. However, he is also concerned about just, you know, if Kazuyuki has a removal spell in his hand, it's like, what's the point of even uh, blocking? Might as well get in for the four points of damage. You know, unlicensed disintegration here, for example, would be absolutely brutal. Oh, yeah. And unlicensed disintegration, a card that there are more copies of in Carvalho's deck than in Takimura's. One in the main deck for Takimura. He does not have Bomat Couriers in his list, which makes it a little bit harder to cast that removal spell, for at least for its full value. It's, it's still a murder. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not you get that, that cheeky bolt on top. Oh, and Takimura does not have a way to interact with that Heart of Kieran, so he actually just doesn't have a good attack here. These red-black decks suddenly having a little bit of a staring contest. Four mana available does mean that there are a couple of options available to Takimura here, but Hazaret the Fervent, it's going to take a little bit of work to get cards out of hand, and Khan Sayan of Urza are somewhat vulnerable <laughs> to attacks on the other side of things. Yeah, not, not, not necessarily a synergy there with Karn and Hazaret the Fervent. Um, but yeah, I imagine he's going to play out a, a Hazaret here because a Karn again is not... Oh, never mind. Maybe make a construct. The yeah. beat down plan. He can make a contract or he can plus. Um, if he pluses, Marcio can still get rid of it by by using PNLR's ability to pump his artifact creatures. But it looks like he just wants to make a two two here instead. Ooh, and that is a very nice draw for Marcio. Soul Scar Mage plus Goblin Chain. Oh, this is a nice interaction. Uh, doesn't, doesn't quite kill off the Scrap Heap Scrounger, but he's putting minus one, minus one counters on all of the creatures on the other side of the battlefield. Dealing yeah. a little bit of damage to Khan, dealing a damage to Takimura himself. And that is the nice little one-two punch that we've seen plenty of times over the weekend. Soul Scar Mage in conjunction with Goblin Chain Whirler means you get to put minus one, minus one counters on all of your opponent's creatures. And that now means that the attacks for Marcio Carvalho seeming much more enticing. Crewing up that Heart of Kieran, killing off Khan. Sorry, Khan. Well, you, you, you made a 1-1. One, one. Well, I mean, that 1-1 one, one may turn into a 2-2 two, two here. I believe that a PNLR was the pickup for Takimura here. Yeah, but does he have the option to just play land hazard and attack? He may well do, in fact. Yeah, it looks like he just has a P in Hazard, so I imagine he's just, it's just time, to, time to just try to race here. A lot of cards left in hand for Marcio Carvalho. The fact that he was on the draw, the fact that he did not take a mulligan, really the difference here in terms of overall card advantage. Yeah, this should be pretty interesting. I mean, Marcio does have the Heart of Karen with the Thopter. You can... He can use that Soul Scar Mage to block. He could also look for potentially like cards like a Braid. Uh, if he uses the Braid on the Hazret, it will shrink it down to a 2 1, which makes it far more manageable. Yeah, having Soul Scar Mage in play when you're facing down a Hazret makes life a lot safer. It uh, looks like Chandra's defeat might have been the pickup there for Cavallo. 
Yeah, nice hand that the Portuguese player working with here. Even though he's a little bit down on life, he has a lot more cards to work with at this point, and that really does swing things a little bit in his favor in spite of the fact that the Life Turtles currently stand at 19 for Kazuyuki Takimura and 11 for the number 16th ranked player in the world, Marcio Carvalho. Yeah, and Marcio does need to be able to turn this around and start attacking at some point because, of course, there is inevitability with that hazard. It will eventually chip away at your life total with the discard effect, and it will also just be able to attack every turn and eat one of Marcio's creatures. So I do like this attack from Marcio with the Heart of Kirin. Get your opponent's life total low. He does have that disintegration for additional damage, and uh, he's, got a, he's got a few blockers. Oh, wait, of course, he's got the Chandra's Defeat. Never mind. Chandra's defeat <laughs> normally not quite the answer that you're looking for when it comes to uh, a god. But that five damage with the likes of Solskar Mage around right, right, suddenly right. representing minus one, minus one counters and indestructibility, it does nothing in the face of all of those minus one, minus one counters. So Nickel Bolas talking about Chandra's only trick. Nice little trick there from Master Cavallo. Oh. Big draw there from Kazuyuki Takimura, except for the fact that we already know Marcio Carvalho. If he wants to just go with the tempo play to kill it briefly, he has that option. Is there a follow-up, though, in order to be able to actually use Unlicensed Integration plus something to fully deal with that Phoenix? Yeah, so Marcio can go for the disintegration here, get Kazuyuki down to 12. Kazuyuki will have an egg. Uh, and then he does have a pretty good attack here. Um, Kazuyuki has a Scrappy Scrounger that can't block. So yeah, it looks like he's going for the aggressive play here. I like it. Use your mana. He also has lots of great draws here. You know, cards like Siege Game Commander or just an additional removal spell or Chain Whirler would be great. Only finds a mount in that turn, so can only work with the Karizev that he has in hand. But, I mean, PNLR's ability to pump an artifact might be the use of his mana that he chooses this turn if he decides that he's in a race here. Yeah, and that's even more reason to use that unlicensed disintegration there if he's just looking to use all that mana and pump it into those creatures. That elemental, the egg that we refer to it, the, the rekindling phoenix will be back. Getting aggressive here and... Uh yeah, I, I like that. A little bit of extra damage coming through from the heart of Kieran where you can. And, and Kari Zeb does a good job of blocking either the Scrap Heap Scrounger or the Chain Whirler here. So at most, he can take uh, six damage. Just five life left for Takimura here. Marcio Cavallo smells blood in the water. Will he be able to close this one out? We'll find out in just a turn or so. Yeah, Soulscar Mage doing so much work this game. It's one of those cards that very many of the players in the room have elected to SU this weekend, maybe looking to go a little bit larger. Indeed, Kazuyuki Takemara not running the uh, the one drop. Oh, okay. Uses cut to take down PNLR, respecting the fact that it's what is it's his best target for sorcery speed removal uh, when what he's really being killed by is the flyer of Heart of Kieran here. Yeah, and Marcio can use, could have also used Pio's ability to, you know, make one of those flyers not able to block as well by sacking uh, an artifact like the Thopter. So now does Marcio have a, an attack here? I don't think, if he doesn't have a removal spell, I don't think he's interested in attacking with that Heart of Kirin because Kazuyuki has to block. So he will block with the Rekindling Phoenix and then it'll just come back on his turn, um, you know, as a haster. And now Marcio has an extra card to consider because Ribbons is in the graveyard at the moment. Just the five land in play for Takimura, but there's nothing to suggest that that won't get a little bit higher. And 11 life, that feels healthy enough, but when you think about three, four, maybe even five of it getting dealt with with a sorcery in the graveyard, thanks to Aftermath, um, the remaining points of damage don't seem quite so unreasonable to expect to come from somewhere. Right. So this is, <laughs> you can see there the, the kind of Wow, what just happened look on Marcio <laughs> Carvalho's face as he's trying to figure out if he has reasonable attacks at all. Yeah. And this is one of the one of the more difficult attacks to try to figure out and you know, very game changing as well. And it looks like he chooses to do this because if by doing this, next turn he can choose to attack with both of the flyers and get in for more damage. Yeah, just plays Rekindling Phoenix, passes things back. 
we're now in a stage of the game where the top card of each player's deck is, in many respects, the most exciting card for either player. Uh, that ribbon's in the graveyard. We'll get an honorable mention on the exciting card front. Yeah, but Kazuyuki still needs to be able to keep the board in uh, the board state in check here. So he needs to find, you know, something like in a braid or a Vraska's contempt to be able to deal with one of those flyers that Marcio has on the battlefield. Now, at some point, I kind of, I'm intrigued at the notion of using PNLR to get rid of a blocker, sacrifice that scrap heap scrounger, get it back at full strength. If he's deciding he's already wanted to attack, then maybe he'll be able to get a tiny bit more damage through. Yeah, I do not think Kazuki is um, currently in a position to attack. So Marshall has a lot of great draws, and you know we can still try to figure out this board state to see if he does have a good enough attack here. So basically, at this point, Kazuki has not added to his board while Marshall has added the the Rekindling Phoenix. Now he can choose to attack with both Heart of Kieran and Rekindling Phoenix, and those will likely both be blocked by the big, fl the, the two flyers Kazuyuki has. Then you have to try to figure out what the other blocks are. Kazuyuki can block two more creatures on top of that. And it looks like Marcio passed. So not there yet. Oh, man. This is so close. Oh, these players, each land that they draw, not what they're looking for. Even though we have Takimura trying to build up a little bit more land in play for Ribbons, I think he'd much rather just have a straightforward removal spell or indeed a creature to be able to gum up this board just a little bit by himself some time here. Five life plays 11. It is very close to the end of this uh, quarterfinal here. We already have uh, Gonzalo Pinto in our semifinals. Doomfall and a Goblin Chain Whirler in hand for Takimura. Oh, so he did not play a Chain Whirler last turn? Or, no, maybe he was holding the Doomfall. I guess he was holding the Chain Whirler to wait for a, a position where he can find a removal spell for the Rekindling Phoenix. As things stand, this Goblin Chain Whirler killing off a Thopter not quite good enough. Yeah. Wow. Look at that patience. Kazuyuki not playing that Chain Whirler in his hand. It looks like Marcio drew a spell here. He's drawn a Goblin Chain Whirler of his oh, own. Oh, with the Soul Scar Mage. The Soul Scar Mage here, absolutely huge. It's already put counters on uh, Goblin Chain Whirler on the other side of the battlefield and Scrap Heap Scrounger. And now we see the potency of the rare from Dominaria really kicking in. And, and this is game. Kazuyuki is down to four. And Marcio has two four power flyers, and Kazuyuki can only block one of them. Marcio just lining up his attacks, making sure that he understands everything that he has to do here. Soul Scar Mage, good against the Chain Whirler because it doesn't die. Also combos with the Chain Whirler. Prowess, the bonus there, but the bonus, not the important thing right now. All it is is Marcio Carvalho making sure that he's confident in his attacks. And he's got to think about the fact that he's playing against an opponent who, for the last two turns, has been stockpiling cards in hand. So many different ways that a big attack here could work out poorly for him. So All from right. Marcio's what are the side of the battlefield, here? he crews his heart of Kieran. There comes Heart of Kieran and Rekindling Phoenix and a Chain Whirler. And Karizev. <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Big attacks here coming through. Couple of creatures back so that the 11 life of Marcio Carvalho ought to be relatively safe. So, you, you, yeah. I mean, this is it. Kazuyuki has nothing. Takimura looks at the two cards in his hand, extends the hand, and Marcio Carvalho advances through to the semifinals. You see a little smile on his face. He knows that he was in rough shape early on. He was uh, two games to one down. Uh, mulligans and uh, awkward draws from uh, Takimura in the latter stages 
of that match, really helping him out, ensuring that he was able to secure the three game to two victory, having to work for, well, almost every game. He, <laughs> he got one freebie in there, but ultimately that's enough to get him through. He will be playing a little bit more when we get on to the semifinals here at Proto Dominaria in Richmond, Virginia soon enough. Uh, big games, a little sad to see that we're not going to get to see any more counter magic in our top eight, but you know what? There's a lot of intricacies to these red-black matches. We're going to see some more of them soon enough. Do not go anywhere. We'll have our second set of quarterfinals for you soon enough after these messages. Grab a friend and head into battle with Magic's upcoming release, Battle Bond. Play sealed or booster draft as you pair up in this two-headed giant casual format. Available at your local game store starting June 8th. Find your store at locator.wizards.com.
Well, our first set of quarterfinals are in the books. Welcome back to the News Desk. Maria, Luis Scott Vargas, Rich Hagen, and Simon Gertzen here on the News Desk for you. Well, Luis, what did you think of that match between Takimura and Carvalho? A pretty close matchup went down to Game 5. Yeah, and the really big turning point in Game 5 was when Marcio drew Chandra's defeat, which combined with Soul Scar Mage actually took down Hazard the Fervent, which you're not supposed to be able to do in the Red Black Mirror. <laughs> that was pretty cool to see the interaction between Chain Whirler and, uh, and Soul Scar Mage in that matchup, too. It did. It, it, it really had a big impact. Marcio played two Chain Whirlers with that Soul Scar Mage in play. Simon, that was a five game set. We didn't get that in the Ernest Lim Gonzalo Pinto one word summary. There was a slaughter. Uh, Bomet Courier drawing more cards than the Esper Control deck combined. That was not pretty to watch. Yeah, what it does mean is that we have a Portuguese semi final matchup. They're both through, they both face each other. Extraordinary stuff. All right, BDM is on the floor, so let's hear from Gonzalo Pinto himself what he thought about that match. Thanks, Maria. Gonzalo, they called your match a slaughter. Uh, it was it was pretty pretty quick dispatch of your opponent, 3-0. Did you like the matchup against Control? Uh, I didn't play test this matchup, but my friends did, and they didn't want to tell me that at some point they were even not play, uh, play testing on the play. They were just play testing on the draw. Uh, so, yeah, I guess they were right. Now, you were cheering along the rail during the second quarterfinal that got played. Uh, we're going to see an all-Portuguese semifinal. It's rare to see someone root to, for the opportunity to play against someone as formidable as Marcio Carvalho. What, what were you thinking about as you watched him play? Well, I wasn't cheering uh, because I was playing him. I was cheering because he won, and I wanted him to win. But now we have to play each other. May the best man wins. Uh, do you guys play much in the house? Did you get to practice against each yeah, other at all? Yeah, we practice uh, between each other, but not this matchup, because this is the matchup we play the most uh, online on G GPs or something. So we didn't play test this matchup a, uh, a lot, but we have to do it now. All right, now I got to ask you really quickly: the shirt and tie. Uh, you, you obviously packed that, and you packed it for this exact moment. Yeah, I guess, uh, because when I top it on Birmingham, my wife said that the picture was really bad. So I brought this just in case, and I'm happy to be using it right now. All right. Good luck the rest of the way here in the top eight, Gonzalo Pinto. Yeah, good thing he packed that tie and sharp-looking shirt, Gonzalo Pinto. Good luck to you. All right, let's take a look at our bracket to see where we're at and what has happened. There you can see Kazuyuki Takimura and Marcio Carvalho were our first quarterfinal red-black mid-range versus red-black aggro. Marcio Carvalho came out on top there with red-black aggro. Ernest Lim was on Esper Control versus Gonzalo Pinto, who we just heard from on red-black aggro, and that was a clean sweep. Three games to zero, Gonzalo Pinto over Ernest Lim. All right, so Portugal v. Portugal in the top half of the bracket. Let's get into the bottom half. And Simon, we're going to kick off with quarterfinal three, Thomas Hendricks against White Derby. Here's Thomas Hendricks, the 25-year-old from the Netherlands, his second Pro Tour top eight from Team Revelation, partnered, of course, with Team Genesis. He's a gold pro. No surprise to see him back on the Sunday stage. His deck is red, black, aggro. There's a look. Simon. Yes, we've seen this deck before, of course. The most glaring omission is that there are no Heart of Kirin. So you, f you see the four Bomet Couriers, you, you see the Scrap Heap Scoundrels, zero vehicles. And that means there are, well, more four drops, actually. You see a Rekindling Phoenix, Chandra Church of Defiant, Hazard the Fervent. I'm not quite sure why um, Hendrix and his team decided not to play Heart of Kirin, but we will see if, if that works out when facing a Braid. Is there a sense that they imagined that everyone would be gunning for Heart of Kirin? It's pretty easy to see what kills Heart of Kirin, and that they just went, I'm going to blank some of your sideboard. Exactly. Uh, I think that's uh, absolutely it. I still think that playing Heart of Kirin is ultimately the better decision, though. All right, let's see his opponent. It's Wyatt Darby, 23-year-old from the United States, 13 lifetime pro points. That means this is his first pro tour. Top eight, perfect in draft across two days. Great job uh, by him. This is his second pro tour. He went three, four, and one at pro tour Armin Kett. Uh, so here's his deck, uh, and this time it is mono red. And uh, what's going on here, Simon? Uh, Darby is not messing around. 24 mountains and all mono red cards. Um, you can see that there are one toughness creatures in this decklist, of course, so Darby is susceptible to, to the Chain Roller trigger. Um, otherwise, 
well, for Hazard with the Fervent, we've seen what this card can do and can do sometimes. But uh, this is what I would look out for when watching Derby. Okay, what's your sense of how this matchup should play out? Is this advantage Hendricks because he gets that more options, or is this Wyatt because he really knows what he's trying to do? I think it's a slight advantage for the mono red deck, in fact, because he just comes out of the gate a bit quicker, and it's it's a little bit scary to play against that, especially when you don't have Heart of Kieran. All right, so that's quarterfinal three. Let's turn our attention to quarterfinal four. Maria Luis. All right, so Owen Turtenwald, there you see him on your screen, 29 years old, Hall of Famer, Team Ultimate Guard. This is his fifth Pro Tour Top 8, which is absolutely incredible. 24 Grand Prix Top 8s and five wins, $322,000. He says the first call he'll make if he wins the Pro Tour is a dinner reservation for the Pantheon. <laughs> <laughs> Testing team there. Let's take a look at Owen's deck, Red, Black, Agro. All right, Luis, what is the benefit here of having Black in Owen's list? Uh, so he's got Scrap Heap Scrap Scrounger, which almost all the lists are playing, and then a, a couple copies of Unlicensed Disintegration, though the biggest gain is in the sideboard uh, with four copies of Duress against Control Decks. How important do you think his Heart of Kieran's are going to be in this matchup? Uh, Heart of Kieran is quite good, and it, it's a, the fact that it has Vigilance and that you often can crew it on both sides thanks to removing loyalty from Chandra means that Heart of Kieran if not answered by a braid, does a very good job of playing both offense and defense. All right, his opponent, let's take a look. It is Manuel Lenz, 27 years old. He is a magic online grinder. In fact, he has never played in a Grand Prix. This is his second Pro Tour. It is first, didn't make day two, so congratulations to him this time around. Qualified via a magic online PTQ. Favorite magic memory? This Pro Tour, of course. Let's take a look at his deck. And this is Mono Red Aggro, and I'm putting Mono in quotes, of course, because we have the black in there uh, for Scrap Heap Scrounger, and we've got Angrath in the sideboard hiding out there as well. And he's got some aggressive cards here, like On Crop Crasher, Earthshaker, Kenra. Is that going to give him a little bit of edge versus Owen? I, I, I actually favor Owen in this matchup. I, I think that the vulnerability to Goblin Chain Whirler, thanks to the one toughness creatures, isn't great. and because Manuel's still playing the Black Lands, he still has the possibility of drawing like a Canyon Slough in the wrong time and, and stumbling a little bit. So what can we look for in this matchup? We often talk about a turning point as to seeing which player is ahead. What can people at home kind of have their eye out for? If a player's attacking with Hazaret, that's a pretty good sign that they're ahead. It's very difficult to remove Hazaret from the battlefield in this matchup, and uh, she hits very, very hard. And, you know, we saw some interesting play with Goblin Chain Whirler from uh, Takimura in the last round, kind of holding it and playing it later. Are, do you think we're going to see some cool stuff going on with that as well? Given the, the both decks' composition, I don't think Manuel can ever afford to hold Chain Whirler. Owen likely won't either. Uh, th these matchups are just fast enough that it really behooves you to play the Chain Whirler quickly. All right, well, we are almost ready for our quarterfinal three and four. Coming up, don't go anywhere here at Pro Tour Dominaria.